Welcome everybody to our virtual town hall. Today with us, we have a um, wonderful uh, speaker, Vladimir Ashurkov, and sorry if I don't pronounce your name super correctly, I don't speak Russian. Um, but um, today's event is particularly relevant with the current um, development in Eastern Europe with Belarus and Russia, and obviously it's part of our broader work of uh, as now um, for democracy, for freedom, and supporting and standing for freedom fighters all over the planet. Mr. Ashurkov is um, a very close collaborator of uh, Navalny, um, the imprisoned um, opposition leader in Russia, and also the executive director of the Anti-Corruption Foundation. And just before handing over the mic to our guest for an intro speech, I just wanna um, mention that here with me there is Colom Ken Salvador, uh, co-founder of NOW, and obviously myself, Andrea Venton, the other co-founder. So thank you, Vladimir, once more for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, I'll just say a few points, and then we can move on to question and answers. Um, first with Colom and Andrea, and, and then with the, with the audience. Um, first, a few words of introduction. Uh, Vladimir Shurkov, uh, I was born and raised in Moscow, Russia, and then uh, I most of my career has been in finance and investments, and then about 10 years ago, I started my political life helping Alexei Navalny, and uh, one thing led to the other. I had to leave my nice corporate job. I had to leave Russia because it became not safe for me and my family. So for the last um, seven years, I have been uh, living in uh, London, helping Navalny uh, and our team, uh, mostly in Russia, but distributed throughout the world in our fight for uh, democratic future of Russia. Um, second point, why is Russia significant? It's a far cold country. I think the, the significance of Russia and, and how Russia is governed is uh, not very well understood uh, in the Western world. Uh, over the last 20 years, Putin has created an unrivaled system of economic and political corruption, which is really polluting the whole world. Um, while there are other countries that um, uh, spew out dirty money, probably China and some African countries. Russia is the only global actor uh, which is malign and seeks to undermine Western political and social order. Just a few examples. Um, since 2014, Russia's incursion in Ukraine uh, has brutally redrawn European state borders, something that has not really been done uh, since World War II. It led to over 14,000 people uh, dead in Eastern Ukraine. That's one thing. Um, a case can be made that without Russia's involvement in Democratic Party email hack in 2016, we probably would have seen a different president in the US uh, over 2016, 2020, because the difference between um, Clinton and Trump was so small, this particular scandal related to the hacking of DNC emails probably was significant enough to um, determine who was the winner in those elections. Um, political assassinations in the West, in Russia, including banned chemical weapons, I of course speak about the latest case of Alexei Navalny, really an epic story. He was poisoned with a military grade uh, poison in Russia, evocated to Germany, miraculously survived. Um, he, in investigation, discovered that his poisoning was directly linked to Russian security services. During this investigation, Navalny even had a chance to speak with one of his assassins um, he, despite all threats, he returned to Russia and uh, was uh, unlawfully arrested and probably is now the most, uh, the most famous political prisoner uh, globally. Um, 
the widespread computer hacks that are linked to Russia and the extent of which is not yet known in the public. So the, all this um, creates a unique situation uh, for Russian tyrannic uh, system of government. Let's not forget that Russia has the nuclear arsenal uh, capable of uh, destroying the world many times over. So this cost of Russian interference of Russian uh, non-democracy, uh, I, I, pro I, I think that billions of dollars would probably not be enough to calculate the cost of it to the world. It's probably trillions. Um, so that's why Russia is significant. And uh, third, um, I would like to really um, uh, commend you guys. Uh, you are a true global movement uh, focused on global issues um, and uh, empowering people. Something that really resonates with the work of Navalny and our team, which has really been grassroots movement uh, financed through crowdfunding and uh, a lot of our pro uh, projects are uh, crowd-based as well. And uh, you're not just doing civil campaigning, you're active uh, in the formal politics with the Vault uh, Europe uh, initiative and the first truly pan-European party. So I'm glad to be here and uh, uh, I would be happy to answer your questions and uh, those from your audience around the world. Thank you, Vladimir, for this um, 350 degrees view. I think it's when you were talking about the threat that Russia can represent to democracy, I was thinking about um, this report that came out recently from the Alliance of Democracies that was showing that the people around the world view the US as a biggest threat to democracy in their country than Russia, which I thought was re really interesting. I think it was something like 44% of respondents viewed the US as a threat to democracy in their own countries versus something like 33 for Russia. Um, and I think it says a lot about the little attention as well that is um, that, that Russia is getting when it comes to certain undemocratic um, behaviors and events. So my first question for you, and I see that we are already getting a lot of questions. So just before getting to it, to the audience on Zoom and on Facebook, please comment with all of your questions. We'll try to get to as many as possible and to kind of streamline all of them into a, um, a coherent discussion. My first question for you, Vladimir, concerns the situation in Russia. So for people that are not really up to date or don't follow it closely, what is the state of democracy today? And we already talked a bit about Navalny's and, and, and his imprisonment and brave return to Russia. But what is the state of the opposition of democracy, of rights and freedoms today? So Russia today is really an authoritarian state, something that uh, started 20 years ago and probably um, took its final authoritative form recently, um, although probably this descent into authoritarianism is not over yet for Russia. Um, so everything is controlled from the Kremlin and uh, Vladimir Putin is sort of the, the architect of the system as is uh, responsible for all major decisions made. So all the legislative, uh, 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 authority is under him. The law enforcement and court system is often used uh, for um, uh, pressure on uh, civil activists and political activists. Navalny is the most vivid example, but there are hundreds of other people who are in jail unlawfully for political reasons. There are thousands more that left uh, Russia um, state media uh, is also pumping propaganda and lies from the national TVs. Independent news outlets, independent journalists are pressured. Uh, their licenses are taken away. They are labeled foreign agents, etc. cetera. Um, and um, it's not just contained within the borders of Russia, but as I said in my introduction, it spills all over the world and uh, it leads to dangers uh, in, um, uh, well, globally, most recent, the, the sort of dramatic example of hijacking of a plane which uh, uh, had a, a Belarusian activist uh, on board and um, his detention 
which is something that put in danger lives of about 170 people who were on that plane, which was, you know, European airline Ryanair traveling from one EU capital, Athens, to another EU capital, Vilnius, uh, and uh, lives were put in danger for uh, no other reason than to get one of the people who had, uh, I believe, asylum in uh, Poland uh, to take him out and uh, throw him in jail. And, and I, I believe he is uh, going through torture and um, a rough time now. So that's in, in a short, that's uh, what's happening in Russia and how it affects the world. Thank you so much, Vladimir. And actually, I want to jump directly on this one, because I think that, if I remember correctly, um, in 2020, there was a constitutional reform. And I remember it quite vividly, because I think it was just before COVID, unless my memory is wrong. But I remember, like, big discussions around what, what was happening in Russia, and how this would further deteriorate Russian democracy. Um, and so, as a, as a last question on this topic, and can I ask you to elaborate a, a bit on what happened to the Russian co constitution, sadly, one year ago? Uh, constitution is, um, is a very good instrument, but it always depends on how you apply it. Um, so Russian constitution um, is uh, not bad. What's bad is that there is no representative political system in Russia. And people who are in power, uh, the, the, the primary objective uh, is retaining this power. And that's what has been happening with Putin. So Putin first became uh, president of Russia in uh, 2000. And he served two terms, which was legal threshold with legal limit at that time. And uh, he engineered that a, his, um, uh, his crony, his friend, uh, Mitya Medvedev became president for another term. Um, and he was totally dependent on Putin and uh, was like a puppet for him. And then after that term expired, Putin again, uh, became president in 2012, served one term, served a second term, and uh, now his second term. And then in the summer of this year, there were amendments that uh, introduced that, that would allow him to stay in power uh, for uh, more terms. So already for over 20 years, Russia has been uh, governed by basically one person, which uh, tells you a lot about uh, state of things in Russia. Um, this, uh, although these uh, amendments that were undertaken, uh, that were adopted last year, are um, they enable Putin to stay longer in power, but the the slide towards tyranny started in Russia not last summer. So uh, it's the events of last summer and these amendments are not as significant as the consistent efforts to undermine democracies and to reduce civil and political freedoms that were happening over the last, let's say, um, decade. Um, so yes, that's, uh, that's the situation. Thank you for this. I mean, it's clear that there's been a systematic repression, right, on, on rights, freedoms, and democracy. And to this extent, we have Eva here, who's actually um, an activist in London uh, from Russia, who's joining regularly our protest, who's asking you the following question. So Belarusian citizens have filed a lawsuit against Lukashenko in Germany. Do you think that this is something that Russians can and should do against Putin? <clears throat> it's, um, it's a tricky question. History has seen a number, dozens of dictators over the last 50 years. Um, I don't think there ever has been an example when a dictator was still in power and a lawsuit brought uh, against him in a third country 
would really have a significant impact on this dictator's fate. Um, it's probably valuable in terms of attracting attention to uh, what's happening in Russia. Uh, but in terms of such lawsuit being some sort of a silver bullet uh, and, and which will have a decisive critical impact on what's going on, I doubt uh, this, is, uh, this will be the case. At the same time, there's probably um, plenty of evidence that Russia and Putin personally have been implicated in crimes against uh, humanity. Um, the most probably vivid example is the Malaysian airliner that was shot in uh, 2014 with a loss of uh, over 250 lives. Uh, but uh, you don't have to go far to, to add other examples to this list, including, um, of course, the uh, war in uh, Eastern Ukraine, uh, thousands of deaths, uh, assassinations of Skripals in um, uh, in 2018 in, um, uh, in London. This is my son, so this is working from home. Um, Thank you, son. Yeah. Ime, I see all of this, and so it's, you seem to be skeptical of, um, on the role that sometimes, some, somehow the international community can play, at least from the, the first part of your of your answer. So I want to ask you this question that we always ask um, leaders from several struggles. That is, which role, like, if you see a democratic future for Russia, do you see coming mostly from internal pressure and citizens uh, acting upon it and or in combination with international pressure? And I'm asking this also linking to the question that Zoe posted in the chat, because today it was announced that in Geneva there's going to be a summit between Biden and Putin, and this is just a further occasion where international pressure can be applied upon the Russian regime. Um, sure. Uh, of course, um, the task of changing Russia uh, is a task for Russian people, and the changes uh, that we hope for the liberalization of Russian politics will come from inside of Russia. Uh, there is no, with, with Russia especially, a nuclear power uh, on par of, with the US in terms of its nuclear arsenal, there is no silver bullet uh, that uh, the international community can uh, apply, uh, there is no single set of measures that would ensure that Russia changes its uh, murderous ways. Um, international community is uh, unfortunately not even able to make a change uh, in situation on a smaller scale like Venezuela, which has been a humanitarian disaster uh, for years. Um, at the same time, uh, international pressure and uh, the actions of international community uh, are important. For instance, the sanctions, especially the individual sanctions on perpetrators of corruption and human rights abuse um, uh, are a effective measure. If you don't measure their effectiveness in that once these sanctions are adopted, Putin um, is scared and, and uh, uh, runs away. Uh, they impose a cost on regimes such as Russia, and these costs uh, weaken the authoritarian governments. And uh, this weakening uh, uh, ultimately uh, would lead uh, to a situation when uh, they will not be so sure of themselves and uh, a 
political crisis of uh, some sort will ensue. And that's where the civil society and the democratic movement has an opening, has an opportunity to influence um, how their country is governed. That's the theory at least. No, but that makes a lot of sense, right? For the international community and world leaders that um, on principle agree with the ideals of democracy, freedoms, human rights, and so on to be able to apply pressure so that then citizens in Russia can um, also pressure the governments and need to, to systematic change when it comes to democracy. Um, so what, what should world leaders do then? So we talked about economic sanctions targeted at, at specific leaders um, to make them you know, for it to have a cost. Is there anything else that should be done? Should there be diplomatic sanctions? Um, should, I don't know, should there be anything else that is being done from, from big democracies? There are a few things. Um, sanctions is one thing. Um, a system like Russian, um, Russians uh, authoritarianism, it probably stands on 5,000 to 10,000 key people involved in economic corruption, which are the, really the structure of this corrupt government. If the top 1,000 people, officials, members of um, business and political elite who are part and parcel of this regime are sanctioned, they are denied their uh, the access to um, Western countries to the Western financial system, the other uh, people involved would be much reluctant to be active in supporting uh, this uh, regime. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is um, I have been involved with Anti Corruption Foundation for a decade, and one of the uh, most important activities what we do is investigation so unveiling um corrupt lifestyle of officials unveiling graft and corruption in large state controlled enterprises and most of our investigations have been mostly done using public sources using public materials applying cleverly various investigation uh, tools to uh, the information publicly available Western governments, uh, through their financial intelligence, through their banking system, through their um, security agencies, have troughs of information uh, related to corruption of regimes like Russia. Uh, only if they would make this information public and truly um, show the, the scale of corruption and uh, injustice that's happening. They would show the people involved in this. Um, this would go a long way towards really uh, attracting attention and uh, making sure that the, these people are confined to borders of Russia, borders of other countries that are involved with corruption. So that's the, the second thing, be transparent. Uh, don't be afraid to use uh, information that was collected over years by your security agencies, by your financial system to um, really show us the extent of what's going on. Um, next thing is West really needs to police its own turf. Just one example. You all know a company, Netflix. It's a huge streaming giant, a um, US public uh, company, um, which we all enjoy the, the, the movies and, and the TV series that they bring to us. In Russia, they operate through a joint venture with um, National Media Group, which is connected to one of the most notorious uh, cronies of Putin, Mr. Kovalchuk who controls a number of media outlets uh, responsible for pumping propaganda uh, to Russian citizens and abroad, and who are uh, instrumental in suppressing dissent and suppressing uh, independent voices in Russia. 
Um, so legally, probably the lawyers of Netflix, when they entered into the, this joint venture, they made sure that formally things are okay and ties with this guy who's re really sanctioned in uh, US and EU are formally um, severed. But the insiders in the industry know that this uh, he's really behind the scenes of what's going on in this venture in Russia. So um, there must be other mechanisms that societies can employ to pressure companies like Netflix, one of the most visible and influential companies in the world to respect their interpretation and to stay away from doing business with um, perpetrators of corruption and abuse. So that's, that's another thing. And finally, I would say that the West um, should really stay open to ordinary Russians, uh, encourage links, ties, travel, education. Um, it should not be being uh, less tolerant to um, corrupt officials and to autocrats should not really affect the widespread uh, the, the population in terms of access to visas, education, if anything, it should be encouraged. So this, this uh, set of measures, they're not, it's not um, exhaustive, but, uh, but um, they're really good ones. And the last two, I must say, we never, we never got them as a response in the past. So to recap for everyone, if I got it correctly, basically, there's different tools for democracies to be able to um, counter authoritarianism and, and support Russian citizens working for democracy, including sanctions, economic, diplomatic, and so on, investigation and exposure of, of corruption, and what you call producing your own turf, so making sure that you know companies that operate or are from your country don't actually um, work with um, uh, those that are perpetrating um, the horrors and crimes that, that you're trying to, to, to stop. And the last point was encourage links, ties, and um, travels, education, and so on. And obviously, this is all the more powerful when a few countries are working together to, to, to push all of those five points forward, which is why we're so thrilled that you joined our request for the G7 to create um, a League of Democracies uh, with countries coming together and coordinating all of this. I wanted to just do a quick follow up to this. So we talked about how Russians within the countries have to um, continue to pressure, push, and so on for change, how democracies have a role to play, and you gave some suggestions of how to do this. But Alex um, in Zoom also asked, um, are there any other ways, in Vladimir's opinion, for Russian citizens who are currently abroad to influence the situation in Russia except donations and media pressure? So, and, and I'll add one element to this. So, we talked about states, we talked about Russian, now let's talk about the rest of the people that are not hyper rich or hyper influential in, in any way. So for Russians abroad, how do you put pressure? And for people abroad that are not Russians but care about democracy, are seeing the news, are, are really heartbroken over what's happening, what can they do as well? <clears throat> it's not an easy question. It's a question that I have been struggling with uh, as, as part of Navalny team for years, people come to you and say, well, we want to help, how we can help, we live abroad, we, we are not satisfied with what's happening in our home country. There is no uh, simple answer to that. Um, we've been trying to, to organize these uh, volunteers with mixed uh, results because there is, I mean, even for people in Russia, uh, if it were, if there was a clear cut um, way of what people should do, um, um, uh, you know, uh, replacing Putin would have been a simpler, but uh, absent of, you know, a, a revolution when people take out to the streets and, and they seize uh the the power um you know th there is no again silver bullet um at this at the two things that uh, uh, that alex who asked the question mentioned 
donations and media pressure are an important. Um, and we, of course, encourage our compatriots living outside of Russia to do that. To put things in perspective, um, I would, I'm a finance guy, so I, I mostly think in uh, numbers, dollars, euros. The total amount of donations that is raised by um, political activists, civil activists in Russia probably is in the tune of 10 million euro per, per year. Our group probably raises from four to four, uh, from four to five million euros in, uh, in uh, donations through crowdfunding. And this has enabled us to really become the most prominent group of political action of a civil fight in Russia, uh, having um, millions of supporters being able to put together uh, mass protest events, which number hundreds of thousands uh, of people across Russia. But in the scale of money, in the scale of um, amounts that Western governments spent on additional security related to Russia, on um, counting Russian propaganda, the, the costs of uh, computer hacks that are initiated in the bowels of Russian security services is probably hundreds if not thousands times more than that. So uh, raising money and, and you know, if, if you are involved in civil activism, in political activism, nothing can happen without funding. Uh, be it a political party, be it a civil rights movement. We, um, our organization employs, or should I say employed, because it has recently been um, designed as extremist. It, it is uh, about 200 people scattered full time, scattered around Russia. So the budget of that is in millions. If more money is raised, will be able to be much stronger in terms of our media efforts, in terms of our investigations, in terms of our political work. So uh, if you can uh, raise money, if you can donate yourself, if, if you can um, make the case to people with access to resources that this issue is important, not just for the Russians, but it's important for the whole world. I think this, uh, this is sort of the, the, the best recipe that I, uh, that I can give you. And uh, one is money, one is political pressure. So um, making sure that politicians in the countries where you live, uh, they understand the importance of um, Russia and what's happening in Russia. And they are less tolerant to corruption. They are um, make a united front against Putin's assertiveness in foreign policy. They protect human rights activists. Um, they try to do it in Russia. They welcome them when they uh, have to go to the West. So all this, um, if, the efforts that are currently going to this are multiplied tenfold, and it's not something inconceivable. I, I'm, I'm sure that we'll see uh, a change in Russia within the next few years. That's very cool to hear, Vladimir, and thank you for detailing why and how people should contribute as much as they can to these struggles. Um, I have a very burning question. I think it is very actual and it's a bit outside of um, what you were discussing, but it's very related to Belarus and uh, you know the flight um, hijacking that you you just you um, cited a couple of questions ago. Um, so first of all, it's a two um, two pieces question. The first one is, what do you think the EU should do 
after what happened in Belarus. And obviously you're not very Russian, but you know very well how these dictators act and what's probably an appropriate response. And as a, as a European, I always wonder how come the EU is often not so decisive in, in, in their answers. And I think that the same would never happen, for example, in the US airspace. No one would hijack a US air, air plane uh, while flying in uh, over the US or in the EU, it just happens. So I'm always wondering what the EU should do better to avoid this and to protect better freedom fighters in their territory. And this link to actually a very personal question, because clearly speaking up is risky and speak up is risky even in democracies, Western countries. So obviously I'm asking you, how do you feel about this? Do you feel threatened uh, in London? Um, and if you can, obviously what you can share on this would be very interesting I think, for our activists. Um, it's complicated. Um... Let me try to do piece by piece. It's no wonder that the EU is less decisive than national governments. That's the design of European Union that most decisions are uh, made by consensus of you know, a 27 governments. It's not easy. I am more often surprised that the EU can come to a decision, especially such a fast one that was done in the aftermath of this hijacking. Within a day, uh, European Union uh, was able to uh, put in place the policy that European airlines would not fly over Belarus and that the flights of Belarusian National Airway Air uh, Line would be suspended, um, the fl their flights to uh, European cities. Um, it was, this was uh, swift and decisive and appropriate. Um, there are a number of other things that can be done um, with respect to uh, Belarus uh, putting pressure on Lukashenko regime and uh, they are both sort of public and non-public. Um, I mean it, the, all Belarusian officials should be denied um, access to um, Western countries. We, we talk about Europe uh, in particular. Um, their funds, and uh, I'm sure, as I said before, the European law enforcement agencies have a lot of information on funds, assets that are linked to officials uh, involved in uh, human rights abuse and, and corruption. Um, so these this funds and assets should be frozen. Um, and uh, support for people who try to fight this uh, tyranny should be increased support in terms of organization. If we look at Belarus, um, the people who came to the forefront of the democratic movement were, uh, if we talk about Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, she, she was never a politician. She was a wife of a uh, political activist who was unlawfully put in jail and she became the, the front woman and uh, probably won uh, the elections in uh, Belarus in August last uh, year. But a, you know, her and members of her team, they're probably not very experienced in what can be done um, by civil movement, by a peaceful movement against uh, such a formidable opponent who has been, um, you know, um, looting Belarus, uh, amassing uh, all the financial resources, all the levers of power in a country like Belarus. Um, and uh, they need organizational support, they need financial support, uh, 
and uh, there's a lot that uh, that that can be done in uh, this respect. Um, same goes for Russia. Belarus would not have been, and its and its dictator would not have been so emboldened to um, take action in the in the last case to take uh, this action against a a. Uh, European airplane and more broadly to apply this level of brutality to peaceful protests that have been happening in um, Belarus over the last uh, 10 months. There are over a thousand political prisoners. Uh, they are uh, in Belarus. They are routinely subject to torture. The Belarus enacts more and more repressive laws. Um, uh, and um, I, I hope the, the European Union uh, get its sex together. It's an uphill struggle. Um, the things, events in uh, Belarus could not have been happening as they were without support of Russia. Uh, the Putin and Lukashenko, they are two dictators. It's important for Putin to prop up uh, Belarusian uh, dictator because he's very afraid um, that a country which is close to Russia um, and, and that people would take would take um, power in their own hands. When it happened in Ukraine, he what he what Putin did to to Ukraine was brutal. He annexed Crimea. He fostered rebel movement in uh, Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and um, uh, he also believes that Belarus is a, is a sort of a, uh, another front for this fight. This goes not only um, just for Belarus, but other dictatorial regimes throughout the world. We, uh, remember Syria when he props militarily regime of Bashar Assad. Um, we talk about uh, Venezuela when he is supporting uh, Maduro. Um, and uh, a proper strategy to bring change in Belarus would naturally involve a Russian angle. So that was my uh, sort of uh, few words on Belarus. With respect to safety of dissidents, uh, for me personally, I feel much safer on streets of London, London than I would be uh, feeling in Moscow. My heart goes out to my colleagues and uh, political activists in Russia and in other countries in similar situation who are constantly um, under pressure, um, who are uh, risking their lives, um, not just in terms of being thrown in jail, tortured, but also killed as we've seen in the case of um, Boris Nemtsov in 2015, a prominent Russian politician. Um, uh, at the same time, I understand that um, a country like Russia, the, their security services have capabilities to, if a decision is taken to undertake assassinations in any Part of the world, London included. So, um, but if if you try, if you think about this threat all the time, you, you can't really live a normal life. So you kind of take reasonable precautions, uh, but you try to live your life um, in normal manner. Very clear. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, very inspiring to hear. Um, and I could be agree that there are many also heroes working in the ground, on the ground in these regimes, and it's incredibly impressive. 
Um, I want to pick on two questions that we're receiving the, in the chat. Um, the first one is a very complex one, but I think you are positioned to answer well. Um, is the one of cyber attacks, Russian hackers, and similar actors trying to harm Western interests on a large strategic scale? Um, do you think this is the case? Do you think this is a strategy? Um, a strategy has been formed. Uh, or what's your take on, on cyber risk from Russia to the West or to democracies across the planet? Uh, over the last uh, five years, we've seen a number of situations when um, hackers um, connected to Russian security services uh, in a verifiable way were involved in hacking. Um, a number of cases I mentioned today, uh, uh, Democratic Party email hack, the recent scandal uh, with a security company called Snowflake when Russian hackers exploited uh, some loopholes in, uh, in, in their uh, cybersecurity software. The, this falls into the strategy of Putin of um, uh planting discord and disinformation and sort of um uh hopelessness and division in western societies he is doing it through a number of means he's supporting fringe political movements um there has been several cases of that in Europe. Um, he is supporting media outlets and, and his, for example, Russia Today, a Russian state uh, channel uh, aimed at foreign audiences. Um, they try to, um, to plant sort of um, confusion uh into the narratives of of, uh, of of into the media narratives that discuss uh, uh international events um and and cyber operations are are part of uh that strategy um uh, i don't have a good answer on what can be done because russia is quite also unique in this situation in that um, it has unlimited financial resources, practically unlimited. Um, it is it has quite capable security services and military operations, um, and it's 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 not there. There are no checks and balances internally in Russia, from the parliament, from independent media, from independent judiciary that can, uh, as in uh, Western democratic countries, that can put limits on what um, a malign person at the helm of the country can do. Um, again, uh, I, I may sound like a broken record, but it all comes to being policing your own turf in in the in the first instance um i you know i i come from the background of business uh, and finance i still have a lot of contacts uh in russian business elite and people as will look at p at L oligarchs people like abramovich usmanovs of this world and people are telling me that uh this close um cronies of putin um there is a system of so-called homework so uh these businessmen are given business favors in terms of you know regulation in their favor or access to to some uh, assets uh inside of russia some preferred financing etc but in, in turn they have to put money into slush funds which are used to finance operations similar to those cyber attacks. So let's say, speaking hypothetically, Mr. Abramovich receives a homework. So his um, 
he has to fill in a slush fund of $300 million a year. 100 million goes to Russian security services people. Uh, their official salaries are low, but their appetites are high. So they need some top up payments uh, to keep them loyal. Next 100 million goes to financing cyber operations uh, uh, and teams of hackers who needs the latest hardware, who need uh, incentives to try to exploit vulnerabilities in the Western computer system, etc. And the next batch of money goes to supporting, you know, fringe politicians, ultra right, ultra left in Europe. So um, the political discourse in Western countries in European democracies is distracted from really pressing issues from really coming together in confronting autocrats like Putin, Lukashenko, Maduro, etc. But um, the sort of social discourse is contaminated by this, you know, infighting and um, um, just political splintering. Thank you for, for this. I think it's it's useful for people to understand how um, Russia works, how, uh, how cyber attacks work and so on. We're almost running out of time. So I'm gonna to try to combine one question with um, a request I'll that- I'll try I... to be short. I'll, I'll try to give short answers, yeah. No, 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 but it's it's very interesting. I just don't wanna keep you longer than, a, than I promised. Um, I'm trying to find a way to phrase it in a positive manner because I like to end those discussions on a hopeful note. Um, so obviously, you know, what's happening right now between, we talked a lot about Belarus, but between Belarus and Russia is, when you look at it, it's depressing, it's heartbreaking and it's infuriating. Um, we also saw, and you mentioned that your foundation, the Anti-Corruption Foundation was des designated as an extremist organization. Um, and this will have consequences, I assume, for um, everyone who works or works, you said there, um, for the work it does, and the same can go for the political parties and political opponents that have been designated as extremists. So considering all of those developments, and of course you can touch on them, but what's your hope? What, you know, in, in one, five, 10 years, what's your hope for a free democratic um, Russia? How can we get there? All right, a few points. <clears throat> First of all, for people who fight this fight, uh, they don't do it uh, because it's easy. They, they do it because it resonates with the values that they have inside him. So um, Navalny, in one of his uh, rare messages from the prison recently, he said, well, we, uh, I'll paraphrase, but the, the, the essence is that you know, we're going through a certain historical process. And he means by that, that Russia does not exactly have a history and traditions of democracy and, and civil rights movement. Russia comes from centuries of slavery, of abuse of power, of uh, totalitarian regimes, uh, last hundred years, uh, you know, included. Um, so it would have been naive to expect that a country like Russia would jump from, you know, Soviet system to a fully democratic system without any friction and uh, seamlessly. Um, even with the latest um, bouts of repression in Russia, probably over the last the last 25 years of Russian history have seen Russian people being freer than at any, at any other time in history of, of Russia. They are, um, they can choose where they live. It wasn't always like that. They can choose where they work. Uh, they couldn't do it for, you know, uh, centuries of Russian history. They can go outside of Russia, they can come back, um, they can do business. It's, um, 
it's uh, I, I don't see it as bad. It's a necessary sort of uh, step um, in historic development. It's just that the current system became entrenched and Russian society is moving on. And um, uh, it's only a matter of time when this, you know, forces in the society uh, brush away the old forms of government, um, uh, which are exemplified by, by, by Putin. Um, and, you know, Russia belongs to European civilization, more broadly Western civilization, uh, historically, culturally, religiously. It's only a matter of time until um, Russia resumes this path to towards European values. And uh, um, the people who are fighting this fight, I, I think they the biggest reward uh, is being true to their own values. If you see something in outside of you that you don't like in your own countries, you try to make steps to, to, to fix it. And uh, that's what people are doing. So um, uh, coming back to Navalny's message, he said, well, it's a historical process. We will probably win. Um, it will take some time. And, and if not, our sort of consolation is that we have lived our lives as honest people. And, and what's, a, what's a bigger price for a person uh, other than that? So um, it's true that now our organization, the civil society in Russia is undergoing a, an extraordinary amount of pressure and um, oppression um, but um, if we talk about our organization it's not the first instance of pressure we have always regrouped we have always reformulated our strategy and uh, we came out stronger with more supporters with better recognition uh, and uh, I, I have no doubt that uh, this will happen um, during this stage, because the reasons for dissent in Russia, they're not going away. People's standards of living are stagnating or, or going down. Um, uh, the rule of law is a, a, a more and more distant sort of target. Um, and um, uh, people are realizing that and it's inevitable that they will find a channel to put it into the political action and to make bring change to Russia. I hope that that leave that uh, sort of leaves us uh, on an optimistic note and that, that's what I truly believe and that's what uh, people in our team and who are fighting for change in Russia believe in. Thank you so much, Vladimir. I'm always impressed. I was thinking while you were answering that we spoke with many people from very difficult situations like Russia, Venezuela, Belarus. Um, we spoke to people from Myanmar, Hong Kong. And there is this kind of like untamable optimism that comes at the end of you know, very dark analysis. And I think that is what, what dictators cannot stop, you know? And I think that you're right. And we say it often in our protest, sooner or later, we will prevail. If it's us, if it's our kids, if it's two generations from now, but there is no way the free um, people that want, to, they want to fight for freedom cannot prevail. Free people in their mind. I mean, people that hope for freedom, they hope for democracy. Um, we not again prevail because the forces that we, we can unleash are so much stronger in history than you know, the force that try to hold back historical developments. So thank you so much, Vladimir, for joining this very inspired town hall. Um, We're gonna always try to keep um, in our protest um, the, the hope for democracy and freedom in Russia alive. We're gonna support what you do. We're gonna reshare what you do. Um, and if you have any call to action for our activists, for our followers, 
at any time. We are very happy to support because you're right. I think the fighting in Russia is one of those fundamental fight of our times, like like many others. But Russia is obviously a very important player, um, a very important strategic nodes for many other struggles to to be um, to be won. So thank you for joining. Say hi to your wonderful family that we see behind. And I hope to see Thank you guys. So Fight for Progress in Russia is part of global fight for progress that uh, you are part of. So I'm glad to be uh, working with you and uh, exchanging uh, opinions and ideas. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank, Thank you so for everyone who joined us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.